Coming to you from our opulent and luxurious 4x8 refurbished broom closet at the National Headquarters in Indianapolis. With duct tape, studio lights, and a mic that you barely can hear, we hope to entertain and educate you. This is the Tango Alpha Lima Podcast. They call me crazy because I'm facing all my giants. They try to scare me into thinking I can't fight it. They tell me I should never even think of trying. But that's just me. I'm going to live out in defiance. All right, all right, all right. We are back with the Tango Alpha Lima podcast. I am your host, Mark Seavey, here at the National Headquarters in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'm joined, as always, by Jeff Daly out of Hollywood, California, of Michigan of the Michigan Dailies, and <laughs> Ashley Garbolja Maldonado of the Akron uh, Maldonados, I guess. Are we not going with Akron? Are we going with just Ohio in general? I'm okay with like Clevelander, Akronite. I also am. Akronite cannot in... possibly be correct, is it? I, I'm. It might be. I'm. Pre- <laughs> I mean, I went to school out there for like a long time. It feels like, like almost a decade. So. Well, one would think one would know if one was called an Akronite, but I guess not. <sighs> I'll fact check it. And we are joined today by a very special guest, Joanne Steen. She is the founder of Grief Solutions, a training company that provides practical training and resources on grief to professional assistance providers who who work with the bereaved. She is a board certified counselor with more than 25 years of experience as an instructor and author on grief, stress, and resilience with a specialty in line of duty loss. She has worked with numerous DOD and military service clients and is the author of We Regret to Inform You, a survival guide for Gold Star parents and those who support them, and Military Widow, a survival guide. She has 25 years of experience as a military instructor, the latter 15 in the area of traumatic grief and casualty assistance. Joanne is a Gold Star Widow of Lieutenant Ken Steen, U.S. Navy, a naval aviator who was killed in the line of duty during her tenure as a senior military instructor with the Department of the Navy. She holds an MSED in counseling from Old Dominion University, a BS in engineering from Rutgers University, and her honors and awards include the 2010 Chairman's Award, Military Officers Association of America, uh, 2009 Alumni Fellow of Old Dominion, Darden College of Education and Professional Studies, and a 2007 Distinguished Author of the Year from the U.S. Naval Institute. Joanne, thank you so much for making time and joining us today. We really appreciate you coming on. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. All right, Jeff, since you complain the most, you get to go first. <laughs> All right. Then I'm going to jump right in. I uh, we, get, we get a little fact sheets on you, but uh, that's not enough because I know that my co-host steal my question so I jumped into the YouTube and I found a, a little thing that you had like spoken blues. about and and uh, it, you had spoken about uh, different the different challenges that gold star families go through and one of the things you spoke about is a lost connection to the military community because in, a, in a, the blink of an eye, that kind of goes away. And I'm wondering, uh, with the American Legion, because we have auxiliary and we have Sons of the American Legion and things like that, what role does an organization like the American Legion have in giving you the support group that uh, you, you lost in the military? And is that even our lane? And, and if so, what can and should we be doing better? Well, gosh, I hope it might be your lane, and I sure would advocate for that. Um, a couple of things happen when you lose a service member. First of all, it's going to depend upon who you lost. If you're a spouse, um, you've lost your direct connection to the unit, to the command, and so, and you've lost, you know, you've lost that. And even though those people were really good friends with you, it's basically human nature that after a period of time, they're going to fade away for a couple of good reasons. If you're in the military. You know, and if you have a loss like that, you're a reminder to other service personnel that good men and women die young. And while they're trying to make their peace with the loss itself, that's something really hard to come across time after time after time. I can remember once being invited to a squadron party after my late husband was killed. And uh, one of the squadron wives came up to me and quite honestly, she said to me, she goes, why are you here? She says, she goes, people look at you and they think of death. You know, and I thought, well, it's really good to see you too. And so you do become this reminder. 
Um, in terms of you know, in terms of the, the other side of it, when you still have the unit itself going through all the gyrations that you do when when there is a death and trying to make your peace with that, and sometimes um, it's just easier to feel you feel sympathy from a distance rather to feel uncomfortable in the present. That, that's what goes on with spouses. With spouses also, they're in a real, a real peculiar position because you still are a dependent. And it's tough enough to navigate deers when you've got, a, you've got a living sponsor. Try navigating deers when you've got one who's no longer with us. So you're connected to the military, but you end up feeling like you're not wanted there. Now, parents are a whole different ballgame because parents have no they have no usually legal connection to the service branch. But what they have is they have this emotional connection. And so I know um, DOD has done surveys and they were really surprised in the past to see that families wanted to stay connected to the military. And part of that is, is holding on to the thing that their, their loved one valued. So especially, especially with the parents, they're gonna identify with, well, yeah, you know, it was important to him or to her, and so I want it to be important to me because it's a link to something that their, their loved one chose to do. In terms of resources and ways of supporting them, I think any time that an organization like the American Legion um, or any other veteran service organization could just reach out and say, hey, you know what, you know, we're, we appreciate you. Why don't you come for a particular event or why can't we hold this particular night? Um, because families, families want a couple things. We want to make sure that um, our loved one's service was appreciated. We want to make sure that their sacrifice wasn't forgotten. And we want to make sure that, that somebody says their name. And that sounds, sounds kind of hokey at first to say saying their name, but it's so important that they are remembered in that way. But the thing is, families also are in a position where usually you get all the invitations around some holiday like Memorial Day or Veterans Day. And there comes a point in time where, you know, you're, it's, it's a fine line you walk because some of them want to say, look, I've had enough, but they'd like to be connected to it, but not only as the, as the uh, representative of loss, but in ways that they can contribute. Long answer, but I hope that answered your question. Jeff. It does. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Ashley, you are up. All righty. So. I wanted to ask you a little bit more. Um, you're an author, and you've, you've written some pieces out there, and I wanted to kind of explore the we regret, or excuse me, we regret, we regret to inform you that you wrote as a survival guide or survival guide to Gold Star parents. So just wanted to have you elaborate a little bit more about that, and um, just how you got oh, started. In the you do have to remember that I'm a former military instructor, so I could talk for about four hours on any topic. <laughs> Okay, just with that help. aside, <laughs> okay, with that aside, um, we regret to inform you is the toughest professional project I have ever undertaken. And I spent spent a lot of time in engineering, I spent time with the military, you know, as an instructor. And uh, it was the toughest thing because the book is written specifically for parents who have lost a son or daughter. And um, the uh, the catalyst to do this came actually back after my first book came out. I was talking to doing a presentation to somebody or speaking at a conference or something I don't recall and this mom came up afterwards and she said uh, she said I know you wrote this book for widows but when are you going to write a book for us and she said um, and she says families gold star families need you know need some help too and the interesting thing that happens is that if you know you think gosh you know military has been around forever and a day we have people that lost all the time you would think there would have been a plethora of resources that are just focused on on military grief and loss. But when we started looking into doing the first book, we found that there was nothing really solid in terms of you know psychological studies and how they come out with long-term studies that were ever done on the impact of death in the military and either the families or other service members. So I was really pretty surprised by that. And um, And then when I did the research for the second book, it turned out that I found, this was about 10 years later, I found just limited research coming out of, of Israel. And it was based on some of the, in some of the wars and some of the, con the um, conflicts that they've had. So it's pretty much an untapped subject, and no we really can figure out why. Um, there is a study taking place right now. It's called the National Military Bereavement Study. 
and but it'll be some time before we see any type of data from it. Oh, thank you. That's incredibly insightful. And with a research background myself, it's always astonishing mm -hmm. when we stumble on things in the military yeah. that have not yeah. been addressed, and we're like, mm -hmm. really? So I'm well, that happy made, to hear that. Yeah, that made a real big challenge to go to write a book like this, because what you had to do was you had to take all the stuff that I learned in a civilian community about about traumatic grief, and it is traumatic, and then you had to have an understanding of the, the military climate and the culture and then put them together okay in terms of how does this stuff in the civilian sector how does that relate to and how does that resonate with the stuff that's in the military today it really reminds me of like a dissertation format where you're just like i'm going to do all of these things but at least yeah. when you are in a program of that of that yeah, structure, yeah yeah there's some sort of formal guidance but to just have to like start foundationally and say collect all of that so yeah. i applaud you that's an incredible body of work and i'm, I'm happy that you were well, able thanks. to trailblaze it. yeah thanks appreciate that yeah. my question has more to do with sort of the timeline now i can only speak from my personal experience from the guys we lost in combat but what would ha what happened was you know we would lose the guys in a some sort of action Mm -hmm. And then the first thing that would happen was the command would lock everyone down. So you couldn't use the phones, you couldn't use the internet, couldn't do anything. Um, and the, uh, the reasoning, obviously, is so that word doesn't leak out before the official people. And totally understand that. But what, what seemed to happen was that if you had scheduled a call with your wife or your loved ones or whatever else, and that didn't happen, then the panic would start up in the family readiness group. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, back in theater, you know, you're, we are operational. So you're, you know, you, maybe the next day you might have some sort of service there, uh, you know, with the helmets and the rifles and everything else. And then maybe a day later, you're back out patrolling. And it's probably by the time you head out patrolling that the family is actually notified. And then they want to know what happens. And of course they can't reach out to the guys because the guys are back out in the field. It always seemed really difficult to figure out where the fine line, like how it could be streamlined or how, because I know, you know, that a lot of, you know, when you lose a loved one, you probably want to know, well, what exactly happened out there? But the people who were with them are now back on the job. And traditionally the job is not there on the FOB or the, uh, the outpost. You de probably don't have internet or anything else. So there's a real disconnect there. And it seems to me that the first opportunity the guys who served with those we've lost is to meet the family is when you return. And by then, it seems as if the the troops themselves have taken the grief in one way, whereas the family has taken it another. Can you just talk about the disconnect between that? Sure. And Yeah, actually, you made two good points in that. The first one is about the lockdown, the comms lockdown. And while it's hard because you can't connect, I was talking to a woman and she received they knew they had taken a casualty over there based on the nature of the particular command. So they knew they knew there had been casualties. Of course, the names weren't there. And um, she received a call from the ombudsman uh, pretty much late, kind of like late evening, like around 10 or so, that said, hey, you know, this is what's going on, but according to what I've heard, it's your husband. So she had enough, she had enough savvy about her and she was she was second generation military that she sat up all night with her little daughter thinking okay i know they're not going to make a casualty call until six o'clock and so 6 a.m came and she didn't hear anything and she didn't hear anything and she was you know what's going on and then later that day her husband calls all right he was able to call her within 24 hours and uh and the first thing she blurted out was i thought you were dead yeah so she spent about 24 hours just in living hell waiting for it because, you know, because somebody had, you know, good news travels fast, right? And uh, somebody had gotten the word out and, and it had released it and it was wrong. And, you know, there's, when I was teaching for the military, there was the cardinal rule of nothing is ever as good or bad as the first report. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that first report was fast, but it was wrong. But the second thing you brought up was how the families really want to, you know, they want to find out what's going on. And that's a chronic problem 
with uh, with families first and I cover it in the book and I cover it in both books is you'll never really find out all the details that's the first thing second thing is when you're notified by casualty assistance um, the whole casualty thing especially the process of notifying is pretty traumatic in itself because what you have is you have somebody standing there and they, they're usually wearing it was like Charlie's and I, I could be wrong on that but they're there um, they're a stranger all right, you don't know who it is, and they're they're acting in the official capacity of whatever service department it was. And they tell you the news, but everything they're telling you has to be verified. So it all comes from wherever your casualty, your your service branch casualty home office is. And they're only going to re- report the stuff that is, you know, that is um, is verified. So you get this information. It's delivered by a stranger, but the kicker is, as a family member, you don't have any proof. Okay, you have no pictures. You have no nothing. That's it. May be an official telling you this, but so what? It's an official telling you this. You don't want to believe that. You have no proof. You have no pictures. You know, you have nothing you can hold. You have nothing that's you know a mangled wedding band or anything. And so you're in a position where you're basically told this information. And you're, you're supposed to believe it. So it's actually the search for that details of what's happened is actually part of the process of, of a sudden death. And particularly a sudden death that's traumatic, but whether it's military or civilian, after a sudden death, the survivors are gonna to wanna to do a couple of things. They're gonna to wanna to, um, find out all the details. And if it's one that was because of a human action or an error, they're gonna to want to hold somebody accountable, okay? They're going to want to demand justice or seek retribution. Okay, and so and that's a part of that's a part of the grief package that most people don't understand that that's a part of it. And then you come up against this information that is uh, is very limited, and you're left with all these gaps. And you try to you know you try to fill it in. And when the guys do come home, the unit does come home, and they they really don't want to talk about it. Okay, but the way the way we process grief is that you may not you may not have to deal with it in the moment but usually it's going to come back at like a place or time of its choosing i'll give you a real a real good example if if i may um i don't want to be too long-winded here oh no you're good you're good to go okay um but it's going to come back my experience was i said we lost a crew of seven and what i found and it was um what i found actually we found in my case where the guys only started coming around to see me two three years after the fact until they could put some distance to it and until they find found out what the cause of the crash was you know then they were willing to come around but they're not they're big on talking about it you know um and yet it's to i could tell you with certainty it still haunts some of them to this day i was at a reunion a 25-year reunion and i uh a uh, senior chief came up to me and he said, I haven't been back since. And, um, and he said, uh, I came here for two reasons. One is to see the memorial. The other one is to give you a hug. And my first thought was, oh, this isn't going to be good. You know, <laughs> it really isn't. And so he gave me the hug and he said, for 25 years, I walked around thinking I killed the crew. Mm-hmm. And, and I said, and you found what when you're here? He goes, yeah, well, I know that I didn't. And uh, and I said, you're right, you didn't. And he didn't want to hear the cause from me. He wanted to hear it from someone who was in the chain of command. And then I was trying to be helpful to him. So I said, well, you know, you're not the only one that feels that way. And he rattled off two or three other names. And he goes, were those the guys that asked? And I said, you know, I said, I don't, I don't remember. But I'm sitting there thinking, yeah, yeah, two of those names are on the list. And so it's something that, like I said, with grief, with trauma in particular, it's something that um, you just don't, you don't get over it, you make your peace with it, and then you, you kind of learn to, to keep the barriers, you make some barriers with it. But here's another thing that, that really, really is difficult for families, which makes military loss a lot harder, is that um, you may find out down the road, whether it's six months, a year, if there's an after action report, if there's a JAG report, if there's a safety report, you may find out new information down the road. And when you find that information, and if it messes with the ending that you've gotten accustomed to, 
Okay, it's like turning back the clock. Yeah. And uh, and the same works with with uniformed military personnel. If they find something new, it turns back the clock because what we have chosen to make our peace with, and we get new information, it changes that ending. It's difficult. It's difficult for everyone. Yeah. All right, well, we will take a quick commercial break, and we will be right back with Joanne Steen, and we'll see you guys in a few seconds. If you care about disabled veterans and children in need, and we know you do, donate today to the American Legion Veterans and Children's Foundation. Any amount helps. Donate online at legion.org forward slash donate. All right, we are back with Joanne Steen, and we are talking about uh, how uh, families process grief uh, when they lose a loved one in combat. And we will go back to Jeff. Jeff, you're up. Yeah. All right. Well, before I get into my question, I have a I have a, a question before my question. Not a question before my question, but I noticed we we did not mention uh, where people can find the resources that you have out there so if if there's a website or there's something like that that we can get out there that would, now would be an amazing time sure okay you can uh, you can find out more information about the books that i have and, and what i provide in terms of teaching at um, www.griefsolutions.net grief solutions is all one word dot net and that's a good resource where you can write to me at Joanne at Military with Oops, wrong one. Joanne at GriefSolutions.net. And uh, I have a Twitter account at Grief Solutions. I have a LinkedIn account. I have a Facebook account. Uh, so, but the website would be the first good. But reach out to me anyway. And again, it's Joanne, J-O-A-N-N-E, at GriefSolutions.net. Outstanding. And... I'm going to extract some of that information from you right now, hopefully, mm -hmm. and, hope, okay. and uh, see what we can do here. On, uh, there are 250,000 Gold Star family members since 9-11, mm -hmm. from something that I read. And, and you go on to say that there are parallels in how service members react to loss with the reaction of Gold Star families. And since now we, since now I'm learning at today years old that there are more Gold Star family members than there are active Marines by a by a pretty good amount. So um, you talked about in in one of the videos I saw on YouTube, you talked about the difference between moving forward and moving on, and. Uh, I was wondering if you can talk about moving forward and moving on in the context of the relationship between Gold Star families dealing with loss and the relationship between uniformed service people uh, dealing with loss. Sure, I could do that. Um, first of all, uh, one of the things we have to remember is that um, there, by gender, usually there's different ways that we deal with grief and loss. Okay, and to, without getting all psychobabbly on it, but there are, usually men respond differently than women do, and so you have both. You have that difference for first thing, and it's not a black or white type thing. And sometimes they have, you know, um, characteristics of both. But the way I used to explain it to my military officers, I mean audiences, was basically when it comes to um, to women traditionally, what we like to do is talk about it. Okay, and usually it's with some, some group, and you want to say how you feel. You know, we eat, we drink, and we tell stories, and we cry. But we do it as a group, and it's over and over again with the same topic, the same subject. Um, men, as I used to explain to my audiences, they basically want to fix something, break something, or go invade another country. But what they want to do is they want to take action. And essentially, with men, what you find is that um, as they, you don't need to, you don't need to cry in order to work your way through grief. And the model um, that we use in America basically is everybody's just, you know, crying all over the place and hugging. But a lot of times what men do is they, um, they'll either, they look to, they, it hurts as much, but they'll look to take that emotional chaos and they translate it either into action, okay, or they turn it into problem solving. 
So a lot of times what you'll have is the guy's looking to solve problems, okay? Or he's looking to think his way through it, or he's looking to act through it. Now, actions are okay as long as they're ones that are, are basically good actions. But sometimes that behavior gets to be really, um, it's, a, it's negative behavior, and they got, you know, it's, I can't think of the word, I can't think of the English word right now. As for instance, you may see in, in commands or units, especially if you've had a, like a mass casualty event, you may see that you have organizations that now have a uh, higher incidence of um, screw-ups, you know, or maintenance starts to falter, or training gets cut, or now you're having more, you're having more service members who are getting DUIs, you know, or they're in more accidents, and there's more instances of spousal abuse. Um, there's more instances of, um, I hate to use the term lingering because it has such a negative connotation, but you have people that you thought were really squared away and now they're not. And you can't figure out why they're not behaving like that. But you have you, know, you have more incidences of both sometimes serious crimes and other times it's just infractions. And we sometimes act out what we can't say or we don't want to say. Here's a for instance. Um, I was teaching when, when my husband, my first husband was killed and I had to really keep it together in the classroom. So I'd come home every night and I would turn off any way that you can get in contact with me, any way whatsoever. And, and I would paint the walls. We had just moved into a house and so I spent a lot of nights just painting the walls. And, um, and it was my way of doing something that was productive and at the end of the day, I had something to show for it. I didn't want to talk about it, I just wanted to paint walls. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. And I and I do uh, a, a quick follow up, and th then I will leave you to my other co hosts here. Um, in the same in the same vein of the parallels, uh, we spend a lot of time in the veteran community trying to uh, trying to fix the things that are broken because of our participation uh, in in conflict, and. We have the we have things with suicide. We have things with uh, homelessness. We have things with underemployment, but basically probably coming from a lot of guilt, leading to uh, ambition gaps. And I'm wondering if, when you talk about parallels, because we d we don't talk about these things with the gold star families. And I'm curious in your experience and research, are you finding similar uh, reactions to this trauma on, on the, the, the civilian side. Okay, tell me what you mean by the civilian side. Um, that, from the Gold Star families, from the Gold, oh, Star, the Gold families. Star families. Are, you, are, you, are we yeah. having the same problems? Yeah, some of them do. Um, you know, some of them do have problems with, with integrating. You don't, you don't get over grief, you integrate it and you have control over it and um, you know and you may find a point in time where something will happen and they'll just bring it all back in an instant you know and it's the same thing like you know you may experience where you turn around something's a trigger and bam it's, it's right there right in your face but normally when that happens it doesn't it doesn't hurt as deeply and it doesn't last as long okay but uh, you know there's there's been families who all, uh, I think right across the spectrum, right across the range of what you've described in terms of the issues they have. But like, I'm gonna use kind of broadly, all, you know, all three of you now are working with, with the American Legion and they're, you're giving back. And one of the things that happens that comes out of, let's say, a traumatic event or a traumatic death or stuff like that, very often there's like, a, it's called post-traumatic growth um, where you go through this experience and you think, it's not just a chapter in my life, pretty bad chapter at that. So what you wanna do is you wanna in some way give back to it. So you're either, you're looking to, sometimes you know you become a better person, you know, sometimes you're just more more empathetic, sometimes like maybe you're reaching out more to, to those folks that you know have been in those shoes because you wanna help. Uh, and you wanna take what you've had and put it to good use, which is sort of what I did. You know, is that to take what I had and, and put it to good use, just like y'all are doing. Yeah. 
All right, Ashley, you are up. Alrighty, so I've been like taking notes ferociously back here. <laughs> like my co-hosts always make fun of me, but I like will scribble and I'll write and I'll draw <laughs> pictures and it's just my process. Um, but I've been very inspired so far, and I know that we've talked about a plethora of things. And I was taking a look at your website, and I know that um, you know the support that you provide and. I was checking out some of the popular topics that you have regarding um, military grief and a shelf life, the 10 tips for working with Gold Star families, men grief and the checklist. And I was curious about the, the 10 tips for working with Gold Star families. And we may have kind of touched a little bit on it, but I just wanted to give you an opportunity to, you know, elaborate on that. Um, from yeah, support. sure. Yeah. One of the things, yeah, like one of the things that happens, first of all, the biggest thing that people have asked for and the biggest thing that seems to resonate um, with all the audiences is what do you say? You know, what do you say? How do you offer condolences? How am I going to do this, whether it's civilian or military? And here's the thing is that so many people are uncomfortable with grief, okay, both men and women alike. And um, although more so one of those one of those genders has a problem. And what will happen is they'll come up to you and they'll put their head down and they'll look at their shoes or my shoes and they'll mumble. And so they won't look you in the eye and they'll say, well, I'm really sorry about this. Okay, don't offer condolences to somebody's shoes. Okay, what you want to do, you come across something like this is, you know, just look the person in the eye and say, I'm sorry for your loss. If you want to take it one step further, you would say, I'm sorry for the loss of your husband, your, your wife, your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, because that's a really overlooked group. group. Um, and if you really want to personalize it, you would say, hey, I'm sorry for the loss of your brother, uh, John. I'm sorry for the loss of your son, Tony. And so you, what you've done just then is you've extended your condolences, you've, um, you've named the relationship, made it personal as of saying son, and then you've identified them personally by their first name. And uh, there's been the, sometimes a conversation about, well, should I use their rank, you know, and, uh, and their last name? And it's like, no, you know, mom didn't, Mom didn't bury, you know, Sergeant Smith. You know, Mom buried Tony. And um, one time I was out in Kentucky, and there was a National Guardsman who was there, and he was telling a story about about this very thing. And he was with the dad, and really young kid. Kid was not married. And what was scripted, I believe, was something that was like, well, sir, where would you like to intern, you know, uh, PFC Smith remains? And he said, he goes, I couldn't do it. He said, so I looked at the guy and I said, Mr. So-and-so, where do you want to bury your son? And used his name, your son, Tony. And uh, that just made it, it personalized it for them because to the family, you know, we're, we're thinking about the person, the spouse, the, you know, the friend, the husband, the wife, the son that, you know, that uh, is a real person and uh, and not that not go by rank. That comes, that importance is for the, for the public. So that's one thing. Second thing is when you work with families, um, you're going to have to realize the fact that there's a pretty good chance that if you do it long enough, some, somebody's going to push a hot button in you. Okay. And so they're going to be, they're, they're, you have to just be mindful of your, ba your boundaries and be in a way where you're going to be able to say, okay, if that happens, what do I do? And just have a plan for how you can, how you can react, whether it's the breathing thing or just being quiet when that happens. Another thing with working with families is that normally families are going to, they're going to be drawn to anybody in uniform or anybody connected to the military. And they're going to want to, uh, they're going to think that you have all the answers because you got the uniform. And, um, and the higher up in rank you go, they think that they really have all the, all the answers because they probably learned this in a session training along the way. Uh, and so they're going to be in a position where they're going to ask you maybe for information, for guidance, for this is what happens. And, um, and there the ways it's difficult to handle those. And sometimes, you know, it's necessary to, you don't want to say, well, I don't know that, you know, but you can direct them, have like one or two info sources handy where you could say, I don't, I don't have the answer to that, but maybe if you contacted and this number or the, you know, the, the casualty office out in, uh, in it's Fort Knox, yeah. And, and, and be able to direct them towards that. Another thing with working with families and also with, with other service members is that 
there's nothing like a good trauma to bring up an old one. And so right now, as you deal with trauma, new traumas always bring up old traumas. And one of the things that happened is uh, most recently I, t- I reached out to the families. Well, it, was, it was earlier this year, you know, like cycle back to when the country started closing down. And I asked the Gold Star families, I said, do you find um, that your, the grief you feel, are you, how, how are you dealing with, with the grief? People, people lit up on this and they were saying, well, you know, it's weird because all of a sudden I thought I was failing at this. Everybody thinks they fail at grief. You know, I'm not handling this right because I keep on thinking about them. Or I find, I find I can't do this. You know, I can't, I can't watch the COVID news. Um, and because COVID has a lot of the, the COVID deaths, especially early on when they, uh, the news just showed all those, all those hospital scenes. What it did is there's a lot of similarities with those COVID deaths. And in many instances, what was happening with COVID was you weren't um, you weren't with your loved one in the final moments, mm-hmm. and that's something that happens in the military. Check. Second thing was you weren't in a position then to see the body afterwards. Check. You know, um, very often, and that's a big issue that you couldn't. Not only could you not see the body, but it's not a question. It's a question of seeing it for yourself. You just got to know. You got to see it. You got to see it. They couldn't do that. Um, they had no say in autopsy options check another characteristic military loss and the other thing is that um now all those covid folks have an identity and it's you know it's a covid death just like you have a you know a gold star death and um they have this now this national identity and all those things play into how well you again how you integrate grief and how you kind of make your peace with it um in military, actually in both books, there's a list of, of ways you can help. Uh, but if, um, if you're interested in that or interested in learning more, there really are a bunch of ways that you can help. And there, there's chapters in both of them. Thank you. That was so insightful. Mark? Yeah, I particularly like the way you talked about how <clears throat> the genders respond differently to the loss and oh yeah from the from the people that I'm closest to uh, in terms of gold star families there's a there's a judge in Georgia Robert Stokely one of the nicest human beings on the planet and the way he dealt with it he could not find closure until he went to the place in Iraq that his son mm-hmm. was killed yeah yeah and that worked for Mr. Stokely and then I have another friend Sorenjal Herrera who lost her son and the basically she's responded to it by coming in closer with all the guys that were in the unit and yeah. she solicits pictures of her son all the time and it's just wonderful to see everyone co- coalesce around it. My question though is it's more um you said you were you had done some stuff up at Carson and mine is specifically about the 4th ID and the bottle of battle of cop Keating which if you don't know the there was a lot of there was a bunch of people that there were there was eight guys who were killed at Cop Keating and one of the lasting questions it's in the movie The Outpost uh, is about that battle and one of the one of the things that came out of it was they were in a horrible tactical position they were in the bottom of a bowl there was people shooting at them so there was a lot of questions about how did these guy how did these people end up there and else in the military kind of look at it and were like, we understand that sometimes things just happen, that that was the only place to be. For the mili- for civilian people, they might not understand the nuances of exactly what's going on. So they have to catch up to the military knowledge base before they can even look at it. And then on top of that, then there was all kinds of congressional hearings. Should they not have been there? Should they have been there? And so that dragged it out. And then Jake Tapper writes a book, and it was a fabulous book, and now we've got a movie out about it. So we're, you know, we're, what, 10 years down the road, and if these people are going to get closure, it's not through that. But the way I've actually seen it from the Gold Star uh, mothers in particular that were involved in that is they welcome any opportunity to get the word out about their kids. Is that the experience we see most of the time on that? Yes. Um, I found of of all the family members, mothers are the most ferocious. But I use that in a good way. Um, and I and it's with particularly with parents because the death of a, a son or daughter no matter even if they're even if mom's 90 and, and their son is 62 you know or something like that it violates the very like laws of nature 
That's just not how the world should work out. And so they're going to want to know everything. They're going to want to, it's, it's so hard for parents. And I'm, I'm glad you used the word closure because I'm going to, I want to talk about that just a little bit. Um, and uh, that's a word we try not to use. I know I try not to use because if you noticed in, in this, I talked about making my peace. Mm-hmm. And making my peace is a way, some people would say, finding closure. But when they say finding closure, it's more of a, it's more of a um, black or white thing. You know, it's more of the, okay, I'm good, I'm not good. And, and finding, getting closure implies that there's an emotional disconnect. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that emotional disconnect is something that is really, you know, it's really you know, parents, they have the hardest time with leaving that go. Like I said, parents who lose a child, even an adult child, it's, it's, it's the toughest type of grief um, that there is, I believe. Um, one of the things when you look at, though, with, uh, and even like with military personnel, you say, well, you, I don't, maybe I don't have this emotional connection to this person. It's been so long or it's been so many years. But what you might have is just, you know, like, Good thoughts about him, you know, or maybe you didn't like the guy or the woman, you know, maybe you didn't think very much of him. You say, well, you know, I really didn't like him much, but that was a tough break that he got, you know. He, you know, there may be an opportunity for, for learning something different or he would have changed. Um, when, I, and this is what I was talking about, how it's always in the news, it seems like, with parents, because they have this connection to the military, you know, it's, it's well, how many, you know, a, a, the military story on the news, and this is specific when you're talking about the outpost, but even it's just a general military story, just kind of grates on your nerves. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize how many times um, the media industry and the entertainment industry uses the military themes, and you see the, you see the funerals and stuff like this, or even any type of that stuff. And my poor husband, I sit there and go, oh, that's just not right. You know, they, they really screwed that up. They, they shouldn't have done that. Oh, that's ridiculous, you know. Or, you know, like, mom will start crying and dad will come over and hug her very stoically. It's like, oh, that just isn't how it happens. So all too often, because parents are predominantly um, civilians, all too often the knowledge they have of the military usually comes from either the media, the news industry, or the entertainment industry. Um, and when it keeps on getting replayed over and over and over, what you're finding is uh, you just don't get a break from it. It just wears you down. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, do you have any uh, final thoughts for us, or what would you, what would you, what would the two sentence uh, takeaway be that you want uh, families to know? Oh, okay. Mark, you're asking the old the old military instructor here to give me two sentences. <laughs> it's just not right. You know? yeah. <laughs> it's just not right. Yeah, you know, I think what's important for them to know is that even though it really isn't said as often as they would like it to hear, to know that their their loved ones, their service mattered. Okay. Um, and just just the fact that they did serve, given it's less than one percent of the population right now that has served, their service mattered. Okay, they're, um, you know, the loss of their loved one, regardless of the cause, regardless of the cause, is important. It is a national loss, and that their loved ones won't be forgotten. So yeah, service matters. Okay. Yeah, that's two sentences. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's it tough, off. though. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, well, that will wrap up. Uh, we really appreciate you being here, sure. Joanne. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that uh, there are some some families out there that get something out of this. And uh, we hope it, if if you're one of the Gold Star families, reach out to Joanne and let her know what you thought. But uh, we appreciate y'all listening to us, and we will see you guys next week. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks. Y'all did great on a tough subject. Thank you. Joe.